Hello everyone, I'm Jonathan Little. I'm here today with Mike Sexton. And today we're gonna to talk about holding on to money because that's a hard thing to do. Well, indeed it is. I was never very good at it, that's for sure. But before we get started, I would like to just say something to everybody. You know, we're not here to lecture you, to tell you what to do and what not to do in life, what choices to make, what not choices to make. Uh, you know, we're not preachers. We're just here hopeful that at some point watching this, one or two of you may take a step back and say, whoa, you know, I better get my shit together and I don't go over the financial cliff like Sexton did, for example. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but really, uh, it's not a lecture. It's just here for information from experiences that we've gone through and that we know about and that you might benefit from. And that hopefully that is the case. I know that whenever I was coming up in poker and whenever I first came into money, I had like no experience with actually having significant money. And I made a lot of mistakes. And I think most people make a lot of mistakes. And if we can help even just one or two people out there not make the same mistakes we've made, that would be a huge success for us, for this video. Um, but like Mike said, the goal in life is to have fun and enjoy yourself and be a good productive human. And sometimes that means spending your money, but at the other times it means holding on to your money and being a little bit more disciplined, a little bit more wise. So maybe we can give you a little bit of wisdom well, hopefully, and also we're here in the Bahamas filming this at the Party Poker Live uh, Caribbean Poker Party, just a fantastic event. And as you can see, that's why I'm wearing the Party Poker logo here. But truthfully, uh, this is not company related whatsoever. Everything that I say will be my opinions and expressed just on a personal viewpoint from what I've been through. And hopefully somebody can benefit somewhere from it. Well, good. So, um... First things first, we've both come into a little bit of money. Mike's come into way more money than I have, and he's lost more money than I have. So um, you have more experience with this than I do. Oh, but I mean, boy. even for me, I know I won a World Poker Tour tournament when I was 22 years old, and then I won another one. And and that's in the days they paid a million to the winner. You know? Yeah, <laughs> and, and I had more money than I knew what to do with. And I was always taught, whenever you grow up, buy a house, because you're supposed to buy a house. Turns out everyone was taught that as well, and uh, the housing market was really high when I bought some of my houses <laughs> and that did not work out so well. So I put my money into things that were kind of spiking at the moment. You know, if, if, ever, if something's really hot, you may not want to put your money in it at that point in time. Um, but so I, I lost some money there. I lost some money betting on sports and gambling. You lost a peanut on that. I lost only a peanut <laughs> compared to Mike. Um, yeah. But just the same, money is relative at the end of the day. And if you have $10,000 and you lose it, it's going to feel awful. If you have a million and you lose it, it's going to feel awful. If you have a hundred million and you lose it, it's going to feel awful. And I don't want you all to feel awful. So what are a few things you've done wrong? Well, I've done so many things wrong. It's just hard to make a little list here in this short amount of time, but I've had a lot of experience in watching others, great poker players, for example, come into money, make mistakes, lose their money. You know, when I look back on the first 20 years of the world series of poker, Here's a little trivia question for you, incidentally. There's only two players in the first 20 years of the World Series of Poker that are not in the Poker Hall of Fame. Do you know who they are? Oh, God, I have no clue. One is Hal Fowler, 1979, the first <laughs> amateur to win, and Bill Smith in 1985. Every other player that won up till 1990 is in the Poker Hall of Fame. And virtually almost all of those players, after they won the main event, went broke at some time. Did the ones who were not in the Hall of now, Fame go think broke? of that. They probably saved their money. Yeah, they kept no, their money. <laughs> no, no, one of them did for sure. But <laughs> but uh, as for me, you know, I, I've come into money, you know, and, and many times, but obviously my biggest flow was when I ended up selling my party poker stock and came into a lot of money at that time, multi-millions. And like you, you know, I whoosh, dissipated much of it right away. Bought a $2 million house. I bought a $1.7 million place in Malibu. I bought two $500,000 condos for my sister and my mother-in-law. Gave money to the family and did all these things that I'm happy about sharing it with them. But it's something that I've learned over time. You have to be real careful about going through your money. Because the $2 million house that I sold in Vegas, or that I bought in Vegas, I sold for $1.3 million. The $1.7 place in Malibu ended up selling it for $800,000. So I bought it the worst time and sold it the worst time. But But... You know, these are things that, that happen, and I'm not sad about Shannon, but the point is, as soon as I got a hold of money, I just started buying these things, you know, a lot of stuff I didn't need probably at the time, 
And I must say, when I first came into money, I didn't have a child either. And I really do believe that that will, your values will change, your gambling habits will change, and life changes completely when you have a son. And I was just was so blessed to have one at the age of 60 that, you know, it's now turned my life around a little bit. But, uh, you know, I'm very embarrassed to have gone through all the money that I've gone through. I'm not proud of it. But obviously all of us, you know, you can't cry over spilled milk. You move on in life. You learn from your mistakes. And hopefully you can help others try not to make the same mistake you did. My mistake, my entire life, virtually kept me broke my entire life, was betting on sports. It was just something I loved to do, and I did it. And when I did it, when I was broke, and I didn't have any money, you'd bet 500 a game. When I had some money, I'd bet 1,000 or two a game. When I had big money, you bet 10, 20, 50,000 a game. Everything's relative. It doesn't matter. You know, you can go broke. I don't care how much you have if you're betting the whole sheet for X amount of dollars. And uh, sadly, I did that for years and years. and was a big uh, sucker at the sports betting, and it kept me broke a long time. And as Bobby Baldwin said one time, you know, if you live in Vegas and are a great poker player, you can have one bad habit and perhaps survive. But if you have two or more, you can't. Like if you're a drinker, if you do drugs, if you gamble in the pit, if you bet on the horses, if you bet on sports, if you go to the teddy bars, there's so many ways that you can go through money. And I see some young poker players making those mistakes after they make a big score, for example, in a tournament. And that leads to other problems as well. When you go through your money, you know, say you win a tournament in September or something, and next April rolls around and you owe the IRS the money, but you've gone through it, now you have real serious issues uh, when you can't pay them. So, you know, it, you have to be prepared for all these things, and it's easier said than done. Take it from me. When you get money, you know, you just think life is easy and it's all going to keep coming in, but it doesn't. So, um, first things first, how do we look as good as you when we're over 60? Huh? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> that's, that's lucky. He stumped me. I, I'm a little <laughs> bit chubby here. That's my problem. But uh, uh, my goal is to get back in shape. That's my goal now. Well, let's do it. We can do that. Yeah, we can do that. All right. So being, I'm not going to say necessarily addicted to gambling, but if you are addicted to gambling, that is a problem. It's a significant problem because that is, of all the things you listed, that's one that will definitely keep you broke because you're always giving away a pile of money, right? Over the long run, you're giving away whatever the VIG is or whatever the expected loss is. And how, how, do you have any advice for people who are problem gamblers? How do they get off of it? I'll tell you, it's tough. It is tough. And I've never done drugs. I've never done, never smoked a cigarette, never smoked pot, never done any of that kind of stuff. But believe me, I understand the addiction that those people must have because I had the same thing in sports. There's no different. You know, you just couldn't wait till the game started and, and bet. And, you know, my problem compounded as a poker player, because I moved to Las Vegas in 1985. And in Las Vegas, generally speaking, poker games are better on the weekend because that's when the tours come to town. So the games are good. But on the weekends, I want to be betting and sweating the football games. So I'm losing my money betting football rather than playing poker and making money. So it's, it's a double sword for me, you know, how dumb I was back then, you know. And, and so it's foolish to do that, you know, and, and I recommend anybody, you know, that if you're betting sports on a serious basis, take a step back and say, whoa, because it is hard to stop. And I see so many kids now in high school and all these kids that start betting and it's hard to get off of it. Let me tell you, because it is addictive. You do love it. You do love sweating games when you have action on it and that's okay, but keep it to a moderate amount where you can afford it. Don't overextend yourself. And obviously in my situation, when you're broke, you know, which I was for many years, so to speak, you know, there's one way that I could think of to get money where you didn't have to go out and borrow, or you didn't have to play or do something, and that was try to win it back on the weekends. So you fire on the weekends with the bookmakers, and then that just compounds the problem because you lose, and now you owe more money than the situation you were in before. So it doesn't help. It doesn't solve the problem. You think it might because you might get a bankroll by Monday, but it's very rare that happens. Most of the time, you lose your money, you owe more money, and you get in deeper problems. Now, in my personal situation, I always had good credit. I mean, bookmakers knew I was going to pay them. They knew I was going to make a score. You know, so even if I owed them, they never worried about it because they knew they were going to get their money. I also had borrowing power, you know, where I could borrow money from players. And I also could always get stake playing poker. So my situation is different than maybe an average guy 
who doesn't have borrowing power, you know, can't go to somebody and say, hey, I need 5000 or 10000 or somebody who might stake them in a poker tournament or a poker game. And if you're not in that situation, then boy, oh boy, you better really be careful about your bad habits because if you're out of money, you're out of action. And I promise you, it doesn't matter if you're the best poker player in the world. If you haven't got money to ante up, what difference does it make? It's very important to be able to ante up. And you need to keep your poker money separate from your life money in the ideal world, if at all possible. Oh, boy. I hear that all the time. That is such a farce, folks. Believe me. Why? Oh, forget. <laughs> I did it when I was a kid. Because as soon as you're broke, <laughs> you know, you take whatever money you have and you go play with it. You know, it doesn't matter if that money is supposed to go to the rent or somewhere else. You got to get in action. You worry about the rent a few days later, you know about it. But uh, it's ideal. It sounds good. And I love the sound <laughs> of it. And I wish I did it. But I know the real world, and I know poker players, and I know gamblers, and trust me, he lives in la-la land. <laughs> um, one thing you mentioned about sports betting, how you would go bet the games instead of playing in poker. I know one thing that I did very wrong for two summers in Las Vegas is I would bet on sports all day while playing poker. And inevitably, I would not be paying attention to poker at all. My attention was elsewhere, right? I'm sweating the games on my Correct. phone or watching it Correct. on TV. And, I mean... But I knew enough that if I was playing poker, that's what would be happening. I'd be yeah. watching every game and every score and, and all that. And it is distracting. And, obviously, you're certainly not going to play your best when that's the case, when you're not really focused on the game. You must keep your focus on whatever is most important. And you have to realize, if you are a poker player, you make money by playing poker, right? It's not like you got rich from betting on sports. It's not like I got rich from betting on sports, right? We lost our money there. That should be a very clear indicator that you don't know what you're doing. And your profession is vitally important. And, that, and you have to focus to play good poker. You can't just zone out and not pay attention. And um, if you are going to be getting, betting on other games, I highly suggest you do it when you are not playing poker. And also, as you said, don't do it during peak hours, right? The problem is football's on Sunday or Saturday. Poker games are good on Saturday and Sunday. And uh, those two compete with each other. So maybe you just don't do it. Yeah. I highly recommend if you do it, just do it moderately. Don't get involved in it. It's fun to have a sweat. You know, I personally think it's un-American not to have the bet on the Super Bowl, but that's me. <laughs> you know? But, uh, you know, sports betting is not the only way you can go through your money and stay broke. I mean, I see many poker players now. I mean, the young players of today are much smarter than us old guys back in the old days because most of those gamblers that used to come out to the World Series back in the old days, they would all gamble big in the pit. They bet big on horses. They bet big on the golf course. They bet big everywhere. And well, they were gamblers. They were gamblers. Not poker players. They were gamblers. Today's players are more educated, more sophisticated, but I see some leaks in some young players. I see them at the bar too much. I see them drinking a little bit too much. And that's the one area that I worry about some players that I think in the end is going to really hurt their careers. So whenever I tell people to um, not drink so much and not do drugs, I always get resistance. And it's because I think it's actually striking a chord with people. I mean, I know whenever I first started playing poker, there were a group of us who did not smoke a lot of pot. There were groups of us that did smoke a lot of pot. I happen to not smoke a lot of pot, okay? I don't know why. That's what they taught me in elementary school, and it stuck. And when I see the group that did smoke a lot of pot, almost all of them are out of poker. Not all of them, but almost all of them. They've all gone broke. And I'm not a scientist, but it seems like they lacked motivation and drive to continuously get in there, put in hours, and work hard. And now, inevitably, someone always says, but look at me, I smoke a lot of pot and I'm doing fine. There are exceptions to every rule. But that is something that at least I have seen in my experience. Maybe I have a small sample. But I would highly suggest you try to keep drugs away from poker. Yeah. And um, same thing with drinking. Something's happening now in poker where I see a lot of reasonably good players drinking a ton of alcohol at the table. I don't know why this is happening, but over the last year or two, you see them every time you see them, they have two beers. And I don't know why this is happening, but I would highly suggest you not let this happen to you because it's just another leak. And, and that's a leak that'll ruin your brain over the long term or give you diseases with your body, right? You don't need that. And um, yeah, Back in my day, in the 70s and 80s, when I first came to Las Vegas, most of the high stakes poker players were all doing cocaine back in those days. But they were doing it. So they could stay awake and play longer hours and play two, three days at a time in Las Vegas. So it kept them awake. They all said it kept them sharper. Now, I don't know. I've never done cocaine. I've never smoked pot. I've never done those things. But uh, I understand that 
people do that kind of thing, and I've seen player after player just destroy their lives. I mean, ruin their lives, ruin their families, destroy themselves. And you know who most of them are, you know, Stu Unger, you know, Jack Strauss. I mean, the list just goes on and on of high-stakes poker players that get in serious trouble using cocaine. And, you know, it cost them their life. Forget about their career. So what? why do you think people do not look at the past and learn from the past so well? It seems like everyone thinks that they are the exception to the rule. And at the end of the day, if I would tell everyone to stop doing drugs, stop drinking so much, stop betting on things that you're not good at, that would just fix all their problems if they listened to me. But they don't listen to me. No. No, because, you know, you learn from your mistakes. And as I said, I'm not here to dictate to anybody and tell them how to live their life, what to do, what not to do, what choices to make. I'm just telling you from the experiences that I've been through and what I've done and the mistakes that I have made that hopefully somebody out there will take a step back and say, whoa, you know, I'm starting to teeter a little bit overboard myself here. I better start towing the line or I too will be going through my money and be on broke street. Yeah, so when you do come into a pile of money, where, what should you do with it? Say you get a million dollars. Like what, what are we supposed to do with our million dollars? Well, the ideal thing, number one is pay off your house because at least if you go broke after that, you don't have to worry about paying rent. So that'd be the number one thing I tell players. And then of course, if desperation ever comes into you, you can always go borrow money on the house if you have to do it. So that would be my first step to tell them. A, stay current with all your tax situation. Believe me, you don't want trouble with the IRS. And yeah. you need to realize you're gonna to have to pay taxes in the future, right? It's not just exactly this moment. Yeah. It's like I gotta pay yeah. a third of this or whatever it is next year. So hold on to that for sure. But the best <laughs> thing you can do if you could set aside some funds that you weren't able to get back, that you just put aside for savings, for retirement money. I mean, it's easily said, more so than done. And as poker players, you never, you always want to keep a hold of your money so you have a bankroll. I understand all that, believe me. I understand it better than anybody. But if you were really smart and educated and think about it and talk to somebody who you respect, who's been successful in life and has some money and has some stability, uh, you will discover that they will tell you to put some money away for a rainy day. No question about it. And, you know, you don't need all that money as soon as you make a million dollar score if you're ever fortunate enough to make one. And, you know, it's getting tougher and tougher to do that. And many players back in the early days of the World Poker Tour, you see them win these tournaments. They're young. They think life is easy. Boy, how sweet is this? And they go party at the clubs and all. And I saw player after player literally just take parties of 10, 20 people to these nightclubs in Las Vegas where literally it cost them 20, 30,000 a night just to go out in one night on the town in Las Vegas. And they did it repeatedly. And I can't even imagine how much money these guys went through and really think how foolish that is of spending your money. Don't be foolish. <laughs> that's, that's really good advice. Um, so one issue, I mean, an issue that hit me really hard is that I ended up buying a lot of stuff when it was high and selling it when it was low. Actually, some of the things I have not had to sell, but they are worth less today than when I bought them 10 years ago. And it, I'm not saying that you can necessarily time the market or anything like that. But I do think that whatever you're getting into, like now all the kids are getting into crypto, cryptocurrencies, for example, there are times when those things are very overpriced and times when they're very, very underpriced. But anytime anyone is really, really trying to get into something and saying it's hot, like gold was the thing, uh, in 2007 or something like that. I bought a bunch of gold high, right? Now people have Bitcoin. A lot of people are buying Bitcoin high. And, um, that is a way to lock up your money. But at the same time, you may end up losing a lot of value and you don't want to lose value. But I definitely like the idea of a house though. At least one house where you can live. Because if you think about most normal people, the biggest expense they have in their life is their house. So if you can knock that out, I mean, imagine you have $3,000 and rent each month, and that's just gone for the rest of your life. Yeah, pay off your house, pay off your car, you know, pay off the things that you can pay off where you don't have to worry about, even if the bankroll goes low again, you know, you can survive. And obviously, it's beautiful. You can pay two, three months rent and all the bills in advance for a few months to protect yourself uh, sometimes as well. So uh, certainly those are good pieces of advice and ones you should follow. But, you know, I know it's not easy. You know, it's, it's tough. You get money, you're high on the hog, and you, you just think it's just going to last, and it, you're never going to go broke like this guy did over here. 
But, you know, it's not just poker players. You just look at the NFL players. And they did documentaries on this. These guys make all this money, and within three years after they're retired, they're broke. And it happens to people that come into big money who never had money before. Because the NFL player, you see them buy all the bling, the diamonds, and all the rest of the stuff, and, and all the fancy cars, and all that kind of stuff. They help out their friends, and, and that's, I think, one of the toughest issues, incidentally, is... You know, I know how tough it is because when I was broke and down and out and I was looking to borrow or get staked, you know, you're so appreciative when somebody comes up and gives you money or stakes you in a tournament or does something like that. And then when you come into money, you know, I couldn't turn people down. It was just hard for me because I know how much I appreciated it. And when I had some money, I staked people and helped a lot of people myself. And, and you know, but you'll discover after a while that it just gets too tough. You just can't help everybody out. You know, you just can't keep uh, staking people in tournaments and you just can't keep doing this if you want to stay in money because eventually it goes away and, you know, it, it's unfortunate and it's tough to tell your friends no, but boy, you said you can do that. You know, and, I can do that. I've never had this problem. And I think the reason is because I, anytime I give out money, I view it as an investment. Right, And if I think it is a good investment, then I'm happy to buy pieces of people. But that is not me necessarily loaning money. I am making an investment I think is good. And I'm usually buying it at you know good, good terms, right? Um, I was actually really fortunate. Whenever I was 18 years old or so, I had just come into money. I was playing on party poker, winning a pile of money each month. And The good old days. The good old days. And one of my friends wanted to get into poker. So I agreed to buy him a computer for like 500 bucks and teach him how to play sit and goes like I was doing. So I gave him 500 bucks to go buy the computer, and then he um, moved out of town to Texas. Took my $500. You lost, all your, you lost it. I you, lost it. You never sent it back. No, no. Long gone. Never seen the guy again. That was perhaps the best thing that ever happened to me. It really was. <laughs> it really was the best thing that happened to me. And so now when people come around and they ask for loans, I mean, this, only hap this will definitely happen as soon as you come into money. I remember as soon as I won my first World Poker Tour of Mirage, I had lines of people coming to me yeah. asking, hey, can you help me out? Can you help me out? And very quickly, they realize I say no to every single person. And no one comes around and asks me anymore at all. I know who does ask because they ask all my friends. They ask everybody else. But they don't ask me because they know I'm going to kind of curtly shoot them down and say no. Yeah. And it's, and it's good if you can do that. You know, it's difficult for me and I couldn't do it. But, but I admire people that can do it and you're doing the right thing to do it. You know, you have to realize first and foremost in the poker world, you have to look after yourself. You know, nobody's bringing money to your door. Nobody's bringing you anything. You've got to go out and earn it. And I tell everybody when it comes to playing poker, I don't care if you're a 2-5 no limit holding player. I don't care if you play 2 and 400 blinds. I don't care what it is. Everything is relative. If you play in bigger games and make more money, you just live a bigger lifestyle. It's just that simple. But either way, you can't just go in for one hour a day or two hours a day and think you're going to win, take your money, go to the movies and ha, ha, ha. It doesn't work that way. Poker's like any other job. You got to put in a minimum 40 hours a week. And most poker players I know put in more than that when they're first coming up the ladder. And you have to work at your trade. And you got to put the time in. You got to put the effort in. And that's how you're going to make your money. Nobody's coming to your house knocking on the door and say, hey, here, I got a couple thousand for you. You, you know, something else is really lucky with me. I just thought of it. The first year that I played live poker, I lost almost every tournament I touched. I had about um, $350,000 to my name that I made from when I was 18 to 21. Then I lost about 200000 of it in my first year. That's a good lesson. Another very good thing to happen to me. You see a lot of players who win their first year, and they win a million dollars, and they just think, oh, I'm going to win a million dollars every year. And then they spend like they're going to yeah. win Jonathan Little year. lost 200000 playing tournament poker. Don't be discouraged out there. Don't if be discouraged. this guy lost his money, if you're in a little downswing, don't worry about it. Well, <laughs> I'll tell you exactly what I was doing wrong. I was playing... Very good sit-and-go strategy in multi-table tournaments. Turns out those are different games. <laughs> and um, I, I wasn't playing well. If you don't play well, you're going to lose. And so I lost my ass. <laughs> I lost a lot of money. And um, you have to make sure that you understand that you will go on downswings. I mean, even today, I mean, I've had two 40 tournament stretches with no caches. And that's just because I'm playing a lot. If you yeah. talk to every high-stakes pro, they will tell you it happens, especially if you're playing in high stakes, tough games where you're not playing against very bad players. Right? Yeah, no, it's tough. I, I tell everybody, I don't believe that there's a more 
mentally demanding sport job in the world than a professional poker player playing tournament poker. I rarely don't. You have to be so mentally tough to be able to take the beat after beat after beat, day after day after day without cashing anything. And it's frustrating. Sometimes you play, feel like you play perfect poker and you take a bad beat and you get knocked out. Another time, you might make a mistake and then you beat yourself up worse for going broke on that particular day. But either way, you're broke, you're on the rail, and it's frustrating. And if you can't deal with this psychologically, I mean, you're going to have a very tough time as a poker pro. And uh, obviously, uh, most of the really great poker pros, they deal with it. They know this is one tournament, it's just one day, but you look at things on a yearly basis. Are you ahead at the end of the year? And that's the way you have to do it as a poker player. It's hard to do. Most guys want to play today, and they'll stay until they win just this much. And then they'll quit because they're a winner today. Don't do know? that. But it's crazy. <laughs> you have to think of poker as a year-long game. The game lasts on a year long. So what you did today really doesn't matter. At the end of the year, look at the bottom line. If you're in the plus, you're a winning poker player. It's just that simple. So a few other things we haven't really touched on so much. Um, fancy things. You mentioned briefly that like you'll see NFL stars with the bling and whatnot. You'll see poker players with the bling. Um, there's a quote I heard a long time ago, something to the effect of true wealth comes from having relatively few wants. And I mean, I've had a fancy watch and a fancy car and it, it's nice, but it doesn't really um, complete you. You know what I mean? I think a lot of people think they need these things because they see other people with these things. Yeah. Just because someone else has something doesn't mean you need it. And sometimes it's a bit of a headache. If you have a fancy watch, you got to take it to the watch store and deal with that, right? I mean, there's just yeah. like one more thing. I mean, most poker players do get fancy watches mm -hmm. when they've had great success. And this is before the days where Hublot came along, and you got a beautiful Hublot watch when you won a World Poker Tour title. Now they give it to you. It makes life easier. Yeah, <laughs> it makes life much better. But uh, in my case, you know, I never had a big house. I had a couple small houses, but I never had a big house. So I come into this party poker money back in the day, and I went right out and bought a $2 million, 7,000-square-foot house. It was like a dream house, and I loved it for a while. And then you realize, you know, you don't really need a big house. You don't. You don't need a house like that. I'm in a much smaller house now, and I love it so much more. I can't even tell you uh, how much more homey it is and, and how much more comfortable it is. And so you don't need the giant houses. You know, you, you just don't need them. But I wanted to get one. I, I was writing that list. I jumped right out. I wanted to get a beach house. I went right out there and got one of those. And so I spent money, you know, right off the bat. Never negotiated prices. It's like when I go buy a car, I go into the dealer and I say, okay, give me the best price you can get. I don't want a hassle and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and they say and, the maximum. <laughs> and, it's too, and I don't ever even test drive the car. That's how bad I am. <laughs> I said, it's new. It works, doesn't it? The guy wants to drive me around the block. I said, forget about it. Let's go. Write the paperwork up, you know. You're ready and, to go. And I'm ready to go. But <laughs> Stu Unger was the best about that. I mean, he bought a new uh, Jaguar once. And he told the guy, buy the car if you bring it over to the over to the Dunes Hotel where I'm playing right now. <laughs> and the guy literally had to bring the car, the paperwork over there. He said, look, I don't know, just tell me what to get. You know, here's some, here. He gave him chips for the car. And uh, <laughs> you could cash them all in back then. And, uh, but, but he was, uh, that's how lazy he was. But anyway. So, um, yeah, you don't need the fancy things. Next on my list, I have women. I guess it could also be men, depending on who you are. A lot of people, when they play poker, in my mind, have very poor relationships with the other sex. Because when you play poker, often that means you're playing weird hours. Maybe you are stuck in a game and you're not so responsible. And inevitably, that leads you to sometimes have poor relationships. People with poor relationships often try to find replacements for those relationships. And that means going out to the strip club or other things. And... I think the solution to this problem is to get good relationships. And that's easier said than done. Oh, way easier said than done. And, you know, and I've, you know, been fortunate to have a lot of good women in my life, three ex-wives and, <laughs> but it's tough being married to a gambler. Let me tell you, it is tough. That's a tough job for them to take because there's not many poker players that go out and lose a big amount today and come home and be chipper like nothing happened and, uh, you know, act like everything's hunky dory because it's not. You know, and so many times, many poker players, their emotions react on how they did in the game, which is not something you want to do, incidentally. You want to try to come home on an even keel, whether you've won or you've lost, where it doesn't affect your family life. But uh, a lot of players aren't capable of doing that, and it's unfortunate. But uh, 
I think that's something, a skill that you really need to work on is just try to act like you broke even every single time. Back when I lived in North Carolina, we had a guy that would drive 100 miles to play with us a couple times a week. And it didn't matter if he won or lost. When he went home at night, he put $500 on the dresser for his wife the next morning. <laughs> he always told her he won $500, whether he lost 2000 or won 2000 And she was happy to let him go play every time because she got 500 every time he went to play. So that was pretty clever. But uh, Genius. You know, you got to keep your women happy. And as I said, you know, it, it's tough for women because they go up and down just like the poker player does. And, you know, it's not so easy for them either. So, you know, having relationships as poker players and... You know, I I see people that get, they want somebody that is a poker player also. Now, personally, I wouldn't want that because when I get home, I don't want to hear bad beat stories from the other sex, you know, and the, your spouse. Yeah. But that's just me. But, but you know, I see many, you know, when you're just playing poker and traveling around and all you meet is other poker players, obviously you hook up sometimes. And uh, a lot of times it works. Whether it lasts or not, I don't know. But, but I understand that, you know, that's what you have in common with this person. But you just wonder when you're going to get tired of hearing the bad beat stories at home. Maybe they ban bad beat stories at home. No poker talk at home. They should, but they don't. They don't. Okay. <laughs> well, I've never dated a poker player, so yeah, I don't know. Yeah. That is interesting. The idea of if you are dating a poker player, they understand poker life more than a normal person. Like I'm Correct. married to a lawyer, right? She doesn't really understand poker life. I do know that um, your significant other will probably feel some sense of helplessness or complete out of control, completely being out of control. Because especially if you are the one making the money from playing poker, if you fail, it's kind of like they failed, but they did nothing. They, they could not do anything, right? They're completely out of control. And that's a tough feeling for a lot of people. I mean, obviously they can have their own job and their own career and their own life, which is definitely something I suggest for everyone. You need to have something going on, but it, it is tough to date a gambler. I, I'm very sure I feel like I'm a, a reasonable, good gambler, and I, I'm, I'm sure it's not easy to be with me. It's very tough, but, you know, it, it's most of the gamblers that I've known in my lifetime, they're all big spenders. They're not cheap. They like to go to fancy restaurants, stay in nice hotels, travel first class, and a lot of women like that life. So, you know, they deal with it because when the good times are good, they thoroughly enjoy the lifestyle. And so you can't blame them for that, but when it doesn't go so good, Boom. Well, so let's talk about lifestyle a little bit because I know I used to have a fiance who would come around to every tournament with me. And I didn't realize this, but that almost doubles the expenses. And expenses are a real thing. And it's tough because you want to be with your significant other. But at the same time, you don't want to double your expenses. And I don't have a good solution to this at all. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you not to, not to take your, your spouse with you. No. And the other thing is, like, we happen to be at one of the most nicest resorts in the world right now here at Baja Mar in the Bahamas. Many guys have brought girlfriends with them or wives with them and families with them here because it's a magnificent place, beautiful beaches, et cetera, et cetera. But when you're a poker player, you know, there's things going on every day in the poker room and you want to be down there playing poker. Mm -hmm. So if you're successful in your tournaments or whatnot, you're playing until wee hours in the morning. So you're not being able to go to dinner with them like you would like to and spend time with them walking on the beach in the afternoon because you're here playing poker. And truthfully, from my point of view, I think if you're here just seriously to make money playing poker, you're better off not to bring them with you. And just like when you travel to Las Vegas, when you go somewhere else. Now, I know the wife and the girlfriends want to go sometimes to these places. And now you spend your time with them rather than playing where you'd rather be. So it's difficult. And I don't know what the right answer is. For some guys, it's better if they bring them along. It keeps them in check. It keeps them in line. It keeps them more disciplined. They don't go out on the town. They don't go out drinking all night. And they don't do these kind of things when they have somebody there with them. And, and you know, it, it comforts them. But in other cases, when you really do want to be playing a lot of hours, you know, it, it's tough. You feel handcuffed. I know my wife does not want to go with me to poker trips because it's like she's going to the place by herself. Or she knows that it may be like she's going to the place by herself. And I don't really want her here either because it's yeah. a distraction. Like, kind of like betting on sports when you're playing at the table. If your wife's pissed off sitting in the hotel room waiting for you to get done, that's not a good feeling. It, no. it, it, I, I feel like things like that don't affect my decision making. But I'm self-aware enough to know that they may. Yeah. Right? And if they may, I don't, I don't need you're that. You're down there playing and she's steaming up in the room sitting by herself. Yes. Yeah. That's not good. Because like you missed dinner reservations for the third night in a row. 
and now she's going to have to. Yeah, no, it's not good this. at all. All right. So is there anything, any other big leaks that you can think of before we maybe give a few actionable points to help? with? Well, with obviously the big leaks are what everybody knows. And certainly as poker players, you're in casinos a lot. One of the biggest leaks of the old school players was playing in the pit. They were all big pit players. And obviously, as we know, you're not going to beat the pit. And But they're gamblers, and they like to let it ride. And I know the list is so long of really big-name players that you would recognize that have gone through millions of dollars in the pit. You know, it's like me at the sports. They've done it in the pit. Uh, some people do it buying drugs. As we said, so there's, there's so many ways that you can blow your money if you're looking to blow it. And uh, spending money on lavish parties when you go out to these clubs in Las Vegas can cost you a lot of money. Uh, wine and dining the wrong women can cost you a lot of money. Uh, or the wrong friends. You know, you can have wrong yeah. men friends, you know? I mean, if you, have, if you surround yourself with bad influences. And that's a very good point. And that's something I've probably done in my life too, too much where, you know, as Amarillo Slim used to always say, if you hang around brokes, you're going to stay broke. If you hang around people that have a lot of money, eventually something might rub off where you're going to get some money or be smart enough to get some. And there's a lot to that statement. As a general life tip, you should try to surround yourself with people who are more successful than you. Oh, yeah. And I have actively tried to do this. I try to make friends with, you know, I have a lot of poker students. And inevitably, some of them are really good at life and business and all of that. And I try to learn from them. You know, I, I am the student. And it's important to realize right. you don't necessarily know everything and you can learn a lot from people who have already experienced these things. And if you can yeah. learn from any of their failures, that is just, I mean, that's what we're doing here. That's so beneficial because it saves you a lot of heartache, a lot of struggle. And that's good. Find, right. find mentors to help you. Yeah. But to you saying that, you know, honestly, because I don't put, I don't put you in that category of somebody who's struggling, who's going to be down and out, who's going to be broke. Who's going to make those kind of mistakes? Because but I have. You're too much of a hard worker, and <laughs> you know, nobody works like you do. And you think future, you think saving money and all, but maybe you didn't back in the early days, like you said. You had to learn the hard way. I have always been very disciplined when it comes to bankroll management, until I'm not, and then I'll, I'll shoot for the stars sporadically, yeah. and it doesn't make sense. It's not logical, and. I mean, my we, answer, we all have leaks, you know? Yeah, we have leaks, all right. I used to see all these charts and all, how much money you need to play in this game and how much money you need to play in this game. And when people come up to me and say, hey, how much do I need to play in this game? I say, what's the buying? That's how much you need. <laughs> and, and, and believe me, that's the, that's the credo I live by for all those years. Don't follow it, believe me. Uh, do money management. Protect yourself. Don't play in games that you can't afford. Don't jeopardize your whole bankroll. Whether it's at one poker game or whether it's in some stock that you've got a hot tip on or whatever it might be, you know, I never got in the stock market. I never got in the crypto stuff. I've never gotten stuff I don't know anything about. Besides uh, sports. And, and including sports, I don't know anything about them, but I did get into that <laughs> uh, big time. But uh, uh, And I'm not proud, believe me, as I tell you over and over again, I look back on the mistakes I've made and I just want to say, God, how could I have possibly have been that stupid to have gone through that kind of money that I went through? It's just mind-boggling to me. And yet I understand it when people do it because I did it and I know how it happens and I see how it happens. And we're just here hoping that somebody watching this will recognize, whoa, that's starting to happen to me. I better take a step back, you know, and take this fork in the road. Otherwise, I'm going over the cliff as well. So, well, you mentioned that you think that I would not do such things, but I have too, you know, and if you talk to all of my friends and I have all of my friends are like good, smart poker players. Like I'm not hanging out with the super degenerate poker players and they've all had these issues too, whether it be, you know, real estate or dating the wrong people. Everyone has a few leaks in their life. And if you can just plug those few leaks, that's going to make your life a million times better. And you, you all out there know what your leaks are. I think most people are aware that, hey, I am um, doing drugs every night until I pass out. Maybe that's a leak, right? Or you know, hey, I give money to... Anyone who asks me, this is a leak, right? So you need to really figure out your leaks and figure out ways to get rid of those leaks. And it's going to sound, sound silly and simple, but really the answer is just to say no and get, get away from those things as fast as you possibly can and never be involved with true. them. That's true. But no one does it. That's the hard thing. So why are you not doing it? You need no. to resolve to do that. And another, I, another problem I had, honestly, is when I was young, a guy told me one time, and I never forgot it, he said, it's not important to be a millionaire. It's only important to live like one. So I've always lived beyond my means. I've always 
done extravagant things now because I've always felt like, oh, I'll make the money. I'm not worried about making money later. But it's just the opposite of what you should do. Live below your means. Mm -hmm. You know, and if you do that, you're going to be far better off in the long run. Take it from me, you know, trying to impress anybody with things or this or that or, you know, you're some kind of hot shot. You never need to brag about yourself. You never need to brag about your money. Uh, just live below the radar, uh, live below your means, and I promise you, you're going to have a nice, happy life. So, I have a few things we can develop to try to hold on to money, and one of them is just purely discipline, right? Like, let's say, I mean, this, this is what I had to do. When I would go to Bellagio every day to play cash games, I would be betting on sports. I'd walk by the, the, the sports book, look at the, the board, pick a bet, whichever one's starting soonest, and bet on one of them. I didn't know all this. I'm starting to like you more. <laughs> I, I, got quite, I got quite a bit of degeneracy in me. <laughs> All right. And um, this happened every day for a year, right? And it started off being innocuous, you know, 500 bucks or whatever. Next thing you know, you're betting $10,000 when you're playing a $1,500 buy-in poker game. And so... I know, I know all about that. Yeah. So one thing that I did is I just stopped going anywhere near the sports book. Once I lost a pile of money, realized I must stop this. I didn't necessarily go completely broke or hit rock bottom, but I realized this is detrimental to my life and my happiness and all that. Because if you win, you don't care. And if you lose, you're devastated. And so I just stopped going in the sports book. I, if I walked by the sports book, I would get sick. Feel, I would feel sick. Because I realized I associated such bad feelings and emotions with that action. Like, I don't want anything to do with it. And so I stopped going there. Um, I used to play a bit of blackjack. Same story. I tried to avoid blackjack. There are some times where it does make sense to play, like when they give you good comps. But um, I, I try to develop discipline to just completely avoid those areas and not even have that in my life, in my circle. If my friends wanted to go sit in the sports book, I would go somewhere else. Right? But at least when you're betting in a sports book, okay, you're putting up the money that you have to bet. <laughs> That's true. When you call bookmakers and bet the sheet when you don't have the money, it's different. And you're going to lose more money because you get to bet more games. If you had to go in a sports book, bookmakers would never survive if people had to put up the cash for all the games that they're betting today, you know, and they understand that because they might bet one or two games a day instead of 20 games a day that they can bet on the credit. And bookmakers make so much more money when they bet more games. Whereas in a live sports book, you actually have to physically put up the money. So at least you're disciplined enough to have the money to be able to put it up. So um, I, have, I have a fun story about this. I was betting with a few guys. We found a, a good way to beat NFL football. We were crushing it. We beat a guy for, you know, 50K one summer or one, one season. Okay. Next season, we were roughly breaking even. And we were, we had, we had one week where we ended up with a bunch of bets, a bunch of $5,000 bets. And we won all of them. What were you doing? So you, you either win all of them or you break even or you lose a little bit. Usually it's the way it worked. So we won all of them. We got the guy for, I think it was like 400K that week. Disappeared, never heard from him again. Right? It's another problem with betting with bookmakers is they may vanish on you. We even tried to find the guy and failed, right? I mean, you're probably lucky you failed at that. Perhaps. Perhaps we are lucky that we failed. But <laughs> that's another problem if you're, if you're betting with people who are not... I've never had that problem. Well, you're... you're... I've never not had a bookmaker pay me because I never beat him. <laughs> <laughs> well, we beat this but guy. But if I ever did beat him and they didn't even have any money, they'd go borrow the money to give it to me because I knew I'd blow it back again. So... So you, uh, so you hope. You don't even know. Yeah, no. I, if you I, never won, you don't even know. But I, there are, that is a problem. You, you know, you can't bet with uh, Shady Joe, the bookmaker. I mean, don't do you, that. you got to know people who you're dealing with. He obviously. paid us for a whole year, no and, problem. Yeah. And, uh, but, <laughs> but if you do bet, you're far better off to bet in legitimate sports books where you do have to post up the money and, because you are going to get paid. Man. Do you, would you recommend to um, poker players to essentially ban themselves from getting credit or loans or anything like that from other people. So like, say, say you go broke, would you tell them instead, you know what, go get a job, make yourself $10 an hour, start playing tiny stakes again and grind it up. I could never tell them that because I could never do it. Fair I enough. Mean, I mean, I would always want to borrow money and play higher stakes, you know, but here's a mistake some poker players made, at least back in my era. That was all limit poker back then, you gotta realize. So if you were playing 15 and 30 or 30, 60 limit, for example, you know, but poker players have egos. They look over there and they see a 50, 100 or 75, 150 game that they want to play instead. So now they'll go get a partner to put up 50% of the money and they'll put up 50%. And now they're playing a bigger game that's tougher. So their win and their earn ratio is going to be less because those players are better. No matter what anybody tells you, the higher the game, the better the player. But 
their ego just wanted them to be able to say that they're playing in a bigger game and everybody looks at them and sees they're playing 75, 150 instead of 15 and 30. It's insane. Just take your own money, stay in a lower game. You're going to make more money as yourself and put that ego aside. The biggest downfall to many poker players is their ego. They think they're better than they are. And the problem is once you start moving up in stakes, once you lose and get broke, nobody wants to come back down and start over again. They just want to borrow money and get back up in that big game that they lost it in and try to get the money back fast. But you have got to swallow your pride if you're not beating a bigger game and drop back down to a game that you can beat. And if you're not able to do that, you're going to have a really tough time making it as a poker player. There's a book out there called The Ego is the Enemy. If you have ego problems, if you... I mean, some people, like you said, like say they normally play 2-5 and no limit, they're winning. They move up to 5-10 on their own money. They're doing great. But then they lose. In their minds now, they may be a 5-10 player. They don't play 2-5 anymore. And inevitably, they go broke. Whereas they could sit there and grind out 50 bucks an hour. No problem at 2-5. Now, they're broke because they, they don't move down. They, yeah. they have ego problems. It's, I mean, very, it's tough. It's tough to move back down. Believe me, it's tough. We see this happening even today in like these super high roller tournaments that are, you know, you see a lot of people playing for tiny percentages of themselves in very tough games. And it's, it's even tougher in tournaments because you get notoriety when you win a tournament, right? If you go from beating 15-30 to beating 75-150... Yeah, everybody in the room knows. But in tournaments, everybody in the world knows if you win, you're a great, successful poker player. And yeah. Are you better off playing for 5 or 10% in a 250000 buy-in or 100000 buy-in tournament or putting up your own 1000 and playing in a $1,000 buy-in tournament where you get all the money yourself? Right. You know, that's an easier field. and But it's ego. As you said, once they start playing these big events, uh, you just want to play them all. So they'll piece themselves out whatever it takes just to say they're in the lineup. Yeah. You know, and that's an issue. It is an issue. It's a tough thing because, you know, if you are known to be, imagine you get into a few high rollers. Let's say you're playing $25,000 tournaments and then, you know, you had no percentage of yourself and you end up losing your money anyway. It might actually be easier to stay in action then because then people think you're a 25K play player. And, you know, now you can play 3Ks, no problem. Right? Maybe that maybe that's part of their, I'm not going to call it a long con necessarily, but... I mean, maybe that's a that's an idea in their brains. I don't know. I'm trying yeah. to figure out, like, why would you ever want to do that? But one thing I'll say, anybody that's going to stake somebody or take a piece of them in a 250000 buy-in or 100000 buy-in, that player's got to be very good or nobody's going to buy pieces of them. I can tell you that. So they have to be poker players. There's no question about it. You, that's true. You just can't bluff your way into those kind of buy-ins. No. And nobody's going to give you that kind of money unless they really think you're a top player because they know how tough the competition is in those fields. All right, so... Another mindset trick is um, I think you can develop, we'll call them morals, where, for example, say you don't want to go to the pit. In your brain, you associate going to the pit with doing bad things. You don't want to do that. Like with, with health, for example. Say you want to get in good shape. You want to stop eating, I don't know, cotton candy because you love cotton candy. You know what? Cotton candy is bad for me. It is unethical for me to eat cotton candy because I appreciate my body more than I appreciate cotton candy. You appreciate your bankroll more than you enjoy sitting in the pit. And I think that kind of thing has been beneficial for me as well. I mean, these are good. It's like all mental, yeah. right? It's, it is. it's, it's just a mindset tips, issue. And they're good points. It is all mindset, but it, you know, we're weak. We are weak. We're weak as people. And it's difficult. <laughs> you know, if you roll them and all of a sudden you get a crave to chew craps and, and you know, you walk by the dice table and the next thing you know, you're shooting. Well, let's think about this. So say you do get the craving to shoot craps. You walk by the dice table and you see someone on a hot roll and you think, wow, I need to go play that game. But in my mind, what I say is no, I'm not weak, I'm strong. And you just keep walking. It does take an immense amount of discipline, but I promise you, if you do it just a few times, it's excellent. you're gonna feel so good about yeah. yourself. Yeah, and just the idea you gave him a minute ago, just don't take that path that leads to the sports book. Yeah. Just pretend like there's a brick wall there and just walk right to the poker room and start focusing on playing poker. And it, it really, that's a very good tip. And, you know, why didn't you tell me this 20 years ago? You know, one thing I actually yeah. stopped doing is I, I stopped playing at one particular casino where the sports book was right next to it because <laughs> I couldn't handle myself. Now that is weak. That is weak. That is weak. It, it's like a Band-Aid, right? I, I will tell you, when you put a Band-Aid on a problem, it feels way worse than if you walk into the sports book, look at all the lines, and say, I don't need that in my life right now. And then you move on. Then you'll feel really strong. And as you feel strong and you become strong, you will develop the discipline and I guess this is the traits to not do those things. And 
Yeah. That's I mean, really, you all have a few leaks, and if you can just plug those few yeah. leaks, you're going to be so much better off. You're going to discover as you get older, you know, you're not going to want to go out to the clubs every night like you did when you were in your 20s. And, you know, you'll start recognizing, whoa, you know, I don't need to go to the club tonight and blow this 2000 or blow this 10000 or whatever it might be. And you'll start saving that money, mm. you know, and put it away for a rainy day or put it away for a house or something that's far more relevant than pissing it off in a club one one night. You know, one thing I've done that I think has also been beneficial is every month I just have money taken from my bank account that goes into my retirement account and investing accounts. Just takes it automatically. I don't even see it. Yeah. Like my child's savings account for his college. Just every month it takes 500 bucks. Great. And by the time he's 18, he's going to have $150,000 yeah. to go to college. Yeah, that's beautiful. And that's and, what you should do. And if you, you know, if you don't miss money, you know, it's like your paycheck. If they take out your taxes, if they take out all these separate things, they, you know, your health care, your whatever it might be. Well, if you don't ever see the money, you never miss it. Right. And so if you can set aside two, three, five hundred a month out of that check as well, just put it aside in a savings account that you never ever touch and then it'll be there. But, you know, it's easier said than done. But it is. It if takes... you don't see it and you don't touch it, you don't miss it. You're right. And that's the truth. So a few other thing I think a few other things I think you can do is you can develop accountability. And you'll see some poker players do things like they'll make prop bets with, you, with each other. Like, I'm going to have no drinks for a month, no alcohol for a month. And if they lose, they have to pay. So they have both accountability and that they have a friend who's kind of looking out for them. And they have a stick that they get beat with if they fail. They have to lose their money. And you can do this in various ways. Like, um, imagine you tell your significant other, hey, I have this problem, which takes openness and honesty, right? You need to be open and honest. And they will hopefully help you with your problem. And you can tell your, your friends, say, hey, I really have a problem with I don't know, going out to the club every night. I, I end the poker tournament. I know there's a club right next door. I go up to the club and I blow 500 bucks. I need help with this. You know, ask for help, be vulnerable. And, and often people will want to help you because at the end of the day, we all want each other to, to, to succeed. I mean, that's why we're here, right? We have all sorts of stuff we could be doing, but we want to help you improve and um, you know, fix whatever leaks you have. So I would tell you to Find an accountability group, whatever that means to you, and um, maybe develop consequences. Consequences are no fun, but um, sometimes people need them. Punish yourself, in other words. <laughs> maybe you need to be punished a little bit. If you are failing and doing wrong, maybe you need to be punished a little bit. It's not, um, I mean, it's not, it sounds almost childlike to say, you know, you need to be punished for doing something bad. Yeah. But at the end of the day, we're all just kids. I mean, I'm sure you don't feel... I don't know. I don't know how old you are. 90, 94 years old now. Well, when I, used to <laughs> I used to teach ballroom dance lessons. Okay. Back when I was younger, and the little old ladies would come in and they would say, "Oh, I'm too old to take dance lessons." And what you say to them is, "If you didn't know how old you are, how old would you be? If nobody knew when they were born, you're only as old as you feel." And that is so true. I've seen people that are 60 who look like they're 30 and act like they're 30, and I've seen people that are 40 who act like they're 65. So age is just a number. Really, it's just a matter of how you feel and how you conduct your life. It's just that simple. How old so, do you feel like you are? So I feel like I'm probably 50. I feel like I'm about um, 12. Yeah. <laughs> Still a young kid, just playing games and having but, fun. Yeah, no, but, you know, I feel good. And, you know, another thing that we didn't touch on, now we're assuming, you know, we, we like to talk pro poker players because we're pro poker players, but the truth is we know many of you have a job and just play poker on the side, probably. And, you know, I think it's important that for you people, you know, that you recognize you have to be very careful that poker doesn't dominate your life where it's going to create problems at home and friction at home, especially if you're losing money. Because wives and family members that you have to take care of that are counting on your paycheck that you just can't go piss it off in a poker game or some buy-in tournament. And, you know, I used to think all the time of the amateurs who dream about playing in the main event of the World Series of Poker. That's their dream in life. But when you talk to a wife and you might have a kid or two, and you say, hey, I'm going to take 10000 of our money and go play a poker tournament, she's going to whop you with a frying pan probably or something. You know? <laughs> it just doesn't happen. You have to earn that money on the side or win it some kind of way or let her know that this is your bucket list and have her encourage you to go do this kind of thing rather than have friction about it. You, you want to make sure you and everyone in your life is on the same page and on the same team. And, you know, if she says, hey, I don't want you going to spend $10,000 out of our money to go 
play a tournament, you need to probably just say okay, or find your way, or make make a uh, a system where hey, I'm going to win my way in. If I win ten thousand dollars over the course yeah. of the year, I'm going to go play. Or if I satellite in, I'm going to go play. I think most understanding wise would say, look, as long as it doesn't come out of your paycheck and doesn't come out of our family budget, you know, if you can figure out a way to get that entry fee, good luck to you. I'll encourage you to go. But don't take it out of our budget and our family household money that we need to go play a poker tournament. So obviously uh, there has to be a reciprocal thing, I think, because if she just says absolutely no, you know, and this guy's his dream, you know, that's going to cause problems. Yeah. Most people are reasonable at the end of the day. And if it is your significant other, they want you to be happy and you want them to be happy. And you have to figure out whatever reasonable is. So, um... You have any other closing thoughts? Well, the other closing thoughts that I have, many of these things that I've spoken about from my experiences and others, I've written about in my book, Life's a Gamble. It's a great book. And it is a very good book, and it has some life lessons in there, in addition to telling the history of poker and some of that stuff. But it's a fun read, and hopefully, maybe when you see it in writing, it'll make you zoom in a little bit more. As I said, I'm really not proud of my past. I've pissed away millions of dollars, but... I don't mind discussing it just in hopes that somebody will learn from the mistakes that I made and doesn't travel down the same path. Because believe me, once you've had money and go broke, it's way tougher than never having had money at all. It's very true. We, <laughs> poker's yeah. a tough life, man. <laughs> and it's getting tougher. It's, it's a tough <laughs> life and it's getting tougher. You're right. So, Hold on to your money. Do your I, best. I have such respect for guys that make it out here on this tour. You have no, because I know how tough it is. You know, I play poker for... 25 years, never had a paycheck for 25 years, just played poker for a living. and But the games seemed easier back then, and it was easier to make money back then. And But, you know, I say that, but I haven't had to grind the poker now for 10, 15, 20 years. And because I've been very fortunate, obviously, with party poker, with having the job on the World Poker Tour, that sort of transition to the business side of the poker world, where I don't have to go out and grind for a living every day like I did for all those years. And... But, you know, I always loved playing, and that's one thing that I was always blessed with. If you have a passion for what you do, I don't care what it is, and it doesn't matter how much money you make, if you're happy every day doing what you do, you're going to have a fun and enjoyable life. But if you're miserable going to work every day, whether you hate playing poker, even though you make money at it, or it's some other job that you hate, you know, you're just not going to be that happy in life. And life is short. I truly believe everybody should do something that they enjoy doing, where they don't feel like it's work. And once you find that, you're going to discover, whoa, life is so much better. That is right. And, you know, we both love poker and we want the poker community to be happy, to thrive. And we want you all to hold on to your money. So don't piss off your money like we did. 